Welcome to the second lecture in Mechanics of Materials. In this video, we'll be focusing on the equilibrium of a deformable body. And so, first of all, let's start off with the concept of loads. And so, essentially, there are two different types of loads. One, we have surface loads. And the other is body loads. And so, from this, an important point to keep in mind is that any surface loads that act on a small contact area are represented by concentrated loads or forces. And if you can recall, this is very familiar to what we covered in statics. So if you need a refresher, be sure to look back at that video. And now to review distributed loadings. Keep in mind that distributed loads act over larger surface areas. So again, concentrated forces act on small contact areas and distributed loadings act on larger surface areas. So now taking a look at an example of a distributed load. So let's say in this example, we're given a simply supported beam with a distributed load on the left side, just like so. And it has a value of 200 newtons per meter. And so of course, this distributed load can be broken down to a resultant force right down the middle as shown. And now let's say the length of the distributed load is two meters. Then hence our resultant force FR will be equal to the 200 newtons per meter times the two meters, which becomes 400 newtons. And so that is the value of the resultant force. Now taking a look at a body force, a body force is developed when one body exerts a force on another without direct physical contact. So again, keywords without direct physical contact. And this is between the bodies. So an example of this could be Earth's gravitation. Here, of course, there is no actual physical contact between Earth's gravity and the objects around it, but of course, its gravitation still affects all particles. Now reviewing support reactions, which again are critical in the study of mechanics of materials, just as they were in statics. So first of all, taking a look at a cable, which looks something like this. Here the cable is supporting this beam to the fixed wall on the left. And of course, there is an angle between the vertical axis and the cable. And remember, keep in mind that this cable creates a tensile force that is sort of pulling on the beam. And so the reaction in our free body diagram will simply be a tensile force in the direction of the cable with the same angle theta. And again, tension meaning the force points outwards. And now taking a look at a roller support, which is represented as shown. Here, the reaction will simply be a vertical force on the beam, since the body can freely move along the horizontal direction, which for example, let's say that is the x direction, following a coplanar x and y coordinate system. Next, we have the pin support which can be represented by a simple triangle as shown. Now the reaction for this one is almost similar to that of a roller, except we are also adding a force along the x direction. Since the body is no longer able to move in the x direction, hence it's restricted in the x and y directions. While it is free to rotate about the z direction, looking at a 3D coordinate system, just like so. Lastly, let's take a look at a fixed support, which is essentially a body that's fixed to a wall, like so. Now the reactions for this type of support are very similar to those of a pin. However, this support generates a moment about the Z axis since the body is no longer able to rotate freely. So essentially for this type of support, the body is restricted in all directions. So now moving on to another major topic, which is internal resultant loadings. 
Here, an important point to keep in mind is that statics is primarily used to find resultant loads that are acting within a body. So keyword here is within. So that's basically any internal activity that's occurring in a body. And so from this, we essentially use what's called the method of sections, which is very similar to a topic you may have covered in statics. And so now taking a look at an example to help visualize this, let's say we have a random body that has the applied forces as shown. If we want to find the internal resultant loadings that are created by these forces, we can create a cut at the center of the body like this. And so now following the method of sections, our lower part of the body will look something like this with force F1 and F2, again, after our cut. Then here on the cross section, we will expect the internal loadings, which could be a moment or a normal force, which are resultant from these external loads. And so again, using our knowledge of statics, we apply equilibrium to find the value of the resultant loads. So now that we know where our internal loads are located and how to find them, we can go ahead and become familiar with each type of internal load we shall expect to encounter in this course. So one example of an internal load is torsion, which is rotation around the longitudinal axis, which I will represent by this curved arrow. And then of course, we also have normal force, which acts directly perpendicular to the cross-sectional area. And there's also shear force, which acts across the cross-sectional area. And lastly, we also have bending moment. And this is represented by the curved arrow here. And so essentially there you have all the possible internal loadings for this body. And so listing them out on the right here, of course, we have normal force, and then we have shear force, we have bending, and lastly, we have torsion. And of course, all of these are classified as internal loads. So now that we have a deeper understanding of internal loads, we can go ahead and revisit the concept of normal force. Again, a normal force acts perpendicular to the cross-sectional area of a body or in other words, normal to the cross-sectional area. And of course, one is developed whenever external loads push or pull on two segments of a body. So keywords push and pull. And so once again, you can see our normal force here on the diagram. You can see how it's normal to the cross-sectional area. And now to help visualize a normal force, let's say we have the solid here and we apply a pair of axial forces like so. And now if we make a cut down the center like this, then again, following the method of sections, if we take a look at the right side of the cut, then we shall expect to see a generated normal force N, which is opposing the external force. So again, normal force deals with pushing or pulling, as you can see with the sketch below. Next, taking a look at shear force, a shear force will lie in the plane of a body's area and is particularly developed as a result of any external loads that tend to make two body segments slide past one another. And the keyword here is slide. So now going back to the picture here, here is our shear force. And as you can see, sliding is indicated by this green arrow, which goes across the surface area. So now, for example, let's say you have a rectangular solid as shown and you apply a force across its surface indicated by the red arrow. Then, of course, we will have a reaction at the bottom going in the opposite direction, just like so. Then, of course, this particular force will create the effect of shearing, which may look something like this. And so here you can visually see the sliding past the two segments which of course results in deformation of the solid. 
And so now if we were to make a cut along the middle section of the solid, just like so, we will be left with this lower segment. Then of course we still have our reaction force at the bottom, but now we will have an internal shear force at the top, which opposes the force on the bottom. And so I hope this helps you visually see how a shear force is created. Now moving on to torsional moment. A torsional moment is simply developed during the twisting of body segments in a body that is of course caused by any external loads, which is with respect to other body segments, particularly about an axis perpendicular to the cross-sectional area. And so for instance, let's say we have a rod and it is fixed to a wall like so. And we apply a torque to the rod somewhere about here. Then that of course will create a reaction torque that opposes the applied torque. And now for you to more visually see the phenomenon of torsion, I'm going to redraw the rod over here. And I will go ahead and draw the deformation with a different color which is expected to look something like this. And remember, this just basically represents twisting of the object. And a good way to visualize this in real life is if you grab a pool noodle, for example, and you cut a slit along the length of the noodle, or you draw a line with a marker across the length. If you twist the noodle, then you'll be able to see the deformation of that line. And also keep in mind that torque is basically the rotational force that you apply on the rod while torsion is the result of that torque so it's essentially the internal effect caused by that torque and remember this is rotation about an axis perpendicular to our cross-sectional area and last but not least of course we have bending moment which is basically caused by external loads that tend to bend a body about an axis that is within the plane of the area. So as an example, let's say we have a simply supported beam like this, and we apply a downward transverse load in the middle. Then of course, assuming that the force is large enough, we will expect the beam to bend like so. And so in this case, this applied force creates this bending moment. And now adding in our three-dimensional coordinate system, x, y, and z, we can see that the bending occurs about the z axis. So that is the key difference between bending and torsion, where torsion was about the longitudinal axis, which would be the x axis, and then bending, it's about the z axis. So again, this force creates a moment which creates the bending effect. And now another prime example of bending is, of course, the cantilever beam, which is fixed on one end and free on the other. And here, this applied force will generate bending, and of course, with it, the moment. So this is why it's called the bending moment, which is again an internal effect resulting from the applied force. And of course, from statics, a moment is simply force times distance or more specifically, the length between the support and the applied force. And now finally, I'll briefly go over coplanar loads, which simply deals with a 2D example. So again, let's say we have another deformable body, which has applied external forces, and we choose to make a cut down the center. Then of course, taking a look at one side of the cut, for example, the left side, let's call the center point O. Then of course, to the right of the cut, we shall expect to see the internal loads, which will only be shear, normal, and bending moment. And of course, we have our 2D coordinate system, X and Y, which again is related to a coplanar situation. And again, we find our internal forces by simply implementing equilibrium, so for example, to find our normal force n, take the summation of the forces in the x direction and set them equal to zero. 
and to find the shear force which acts in the vertical direction set the sum of the forces in the y direction equal to zero and finally to find the bending moment set the summation of the moments about o equal to zero and i'll just go ahead and color code these and so there you have the concept of coplanar loads that'll be all for this video i hope you found this very helpful in your study of solid mechanics and if you did make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more thank you for watching